Um, okay, so today we have uh, Richard Halbrun. Richard is a alumnus, he's an Aggie, and he actually was the TA for this course. So, uh, not for me. <laughs> he TA this course um, a few years back and, and has had a career in tech and wildlife, um, starting as a biologist and for um, working on things like management plans and the like, um, and has progressed through now into a supervisory role, but also an outreach role where he does a lot of presentations. I saw Richard present something on recovering the American Wildlife Act um, at the National uh, Wildlife Society meeting. And that was a, he was a speaker in a symposium on the act and about essentially how, what the act means and how people should get engaged in it. Um, the only part of Richard's day job, I think. <laughs> so what I asked him to do was come talk to you because that's going to be the basis of your, a lot of what you're going to work on. So, Richard. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. If y'all get dizzy from me walking too much, or if I'm walking too much for the camera, someone flag me down and I'll slow down and stand in one spot. Very happy to be here uh, back at A&M, although it looks a little different than it did 20 something years ago. Uh, so it's been a long time, but I'm happy to be here. Um, why would a Parks and Wildlife biologist come talk to a 303 class? They normally speak. This would be the time to speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because some people in this class could potentially end up in, in your field. Mm -hmm. And you want to make it So maybe a long, maybe a long term investment. Okay, could be a recruitment tactic. Maybe you showed up for a job interview this morning, didn't even know it. Maybe, maybe not. Why else? Out of the goodness of our hearts? Yeah, maybe? All right, well, let's see. So, in my day job, I talk a lot about budgets and procedures and timesheets and monthly reports and incredibly boring stuff. But that's what happens when you spend 20 years in a field and you progress. Um, but I wasn't always like that. Um, I started out on the banks of Cypress Creek outside of Houston, and that is where my passion began. I suspect if the statistics hold true that many of you are anchored to a place, a place, a place of nature, a place of wildness, whether it's a ranch or a nature center or a, a little patch of woods near your home, who, who identifies with a place emotionally, deeply, passionately, emotionally, right? So that's what the statistics bear out, that people in our field start off with a sense of place. And this was my place. This is where I stuck my toes in the sand and, and caught my first fish and spent time looking at birds. And uh, this was the extent of what I knew about wildlife because I lived in Houston, right? And my parents were urbanites and they didn't understand how to guide me, how to guide you in this pursuit of lifelong learning and passion for the outdoors. So everything that I had came from a sense of basically what I learned at this university. Um, but I had a teacher, as many of you have. You have an uncle, an aunt, a teacher, a nature center counselor, summer camp counselor that takes you under their wing, so to speak. That's a joke, you don't have to laugh. Or you can roll your eyes, that's fine. <laughs> um, and so I had an eighth grade science teacher that taught me how to bird band. And that was my foray into wildlife science, wildlife management. Got a job with Parks and Wildlife after my master's where I studied bobcats here at A&M. Um, did bobcat research in the field, caught bobcats, caught coyotes, raccoons, skunks, the whole nine yards. Lived on a ranch for a year, two years and uh, got more ensconced into the field of wildlife management. And then I became a biologist with Parks and Wildlife where I advised private landowners on how to manage their habitat. So that was the goal. About 120 management plans a year, gave them harvest recommendations, gave them science recommendations, gave them land management advice, identified their objectives and helped them accomplish those objectives. Um, but, 
there were, there were some other steps, right? So after I did that for a couple years, I, I noticed that there was uh, some missing components that in the county that I, where I was living, I worked with about 100, 150 landowners out of a town of 50,000 people. So I became an urban wildlife biologist, and now I'm the, the supervisor of the urban wildlife program, where we have 26 million people in the state of Texas. How many of them know a lick about fish and wildlife management? You want to guess? Give me a percentage. Three percent. I think we're doing a little bit. It's probably somewhere between three and ten percent. So about four percent of Texans hunt, about five percent, ten percent of them fish, and and everyone else is sort of just a hobby, right? It might be as high as twenty percent if you include bird watchers and all that stuff. But we have so much diversity in Texas that we have, as natural resource professionals, we have to know about them. And we have to teach people about their value, their abundance, their diversity, and their challenges. So we have, what, 30,000-ish species of invertebrates. We have 213-ish species of reptiles and amphibians. We have exactly 641 species of birds in Texas. And the reason I know that is that slide used to say 635. And I gave a presentation in South Texas, and a woman interrupted my presentation and said, excuse me, Richard, your slide is wrong. Okay, I can handle that. I make mistakes sometimes, right? So uh, I proceeded in my 45-minute presentation. I got a 20-minute lecture mm -hmm. because this woman was a member of the Birds and Records Committee that established how many species were in Texas. So that was fun, getting a 20-minute dressing down about how one number of my slide was wrong. So the answer, 641 species. At least it was like five years ago. 141 terrestrial mammal species, plus about two or three dozen aquatic mammals, uh, mostly marine mammals. Uh, 5,200 species of plants, so we have an abundance, right? This is not Rhode Island we're talking about, this is Texas. But those, those, those abundance, those abundant diversity of Texas hasn't always lived the high life. We've had some challenges. In the mid to late 1800s, we have a thriving wildlife population, but it was being threatened by what? It says it right here. It was being threatened by overharvested, overharvest, but it was more threatened by people. Just the sheer number of people on the East Coast pushed out that wildlife habitat. They were logging to build their towns, their homes. So westward expansion had begun to impact western species. So this, uh, this idea of the, the wild frontier was being tamed, right? So people were moving west and impacting wildlife habitat. And they were harvesting, they were using, it was overconsumption, overharvest, and then habitat exploitation. So society became concerned. But it wasn't just this idea of hunting for food, right? This idea of hunters being the big bad wolf and over harvesting to fill the freezer. There were lots of businesses and people that were after feathers. You can't eat feathers, so they were making hats. And this was actually a huge problem for wildlife. In fact, in 1897, Harper's Bazaar published an editorial that said that there should be an owl or ostrich left with a single feather apiece hardly seems possible. So what you have is you have all these species, egrets, herons, pheasants, chucker, quail, they're all har being harvested for their feathers for ladies' fashion. At the same time, we're having problems with our hunted species, our game species, hunted for meat. Elk hunters at this time, in the 1930s, 1920s, were saying that they weren't sure that their grandchildren would ever see an elk. So what they did is they followed the example of their wives. I'm going to run through this, and if you're interested, I can go back to it. But the whole, the whole feather thing, the ladies' fashion, 
uh, some women decided to say, you know, I'm not going to buy these kinds of hats. And I would appreciate you, my friends and colleagues, if you didn't buy these hats. And so they started these clubs. And they got legislation passed. They got the Lacey Act passed. Have you learned about the Lacey Act? Okay, what does the Lacey Act do? prevents interstate transport of wildlife and wildlife parks, right? They also got the Migratory Bird Treaty passed and the Migratory Bird Treaty Act passed. And what does that do? 1916 and 1918, have you all learned that yet? What does the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918 do? Uh, it prevents taking of uh, migratory birds across different states. Right, it prevents, right, prevents all harvest, all take, of any migratory bird species, one of the most powerful wildlife legislation we have even today, very powerful legislation, over 100 years old. That came about because the women got active and they said, we want to protect these beautiful birds. Well, their husbands, the elite of Boston, Philadelphia, they saw what their wives had done and they said, wait a minute, I'm concerned about elk. And so they got, anyone know 1937, what legislation was passed in 1937? Have you learned this yet? Pittman-Robertson Act? Okay, this is key. If you're taking notes, Pittman-Robertson Pittman -Robertson Act of 1937 was the most influential wildlife legislation in United States history. What does it do? Anyone remember? It, Okay, so that was a bunch of nouns. What what did it actually do? It placed the tax? Yes. Okay, so that is what most people think. No, no. <laughs> the tax is already there. And you'll see why that's important in a minute. The tax was already there and it redirected. It said, well, if these people are being taxed for their hobby, actually the, the hunters were the ones that sang it, we're being taxed for our hobby, take that money and put it towards the elk. So what happened to the elk? How do we do? Did we as natural resource professionals fix the problem? Go like this, yeah, okay. How do we do with the pronghorn? Do we fix the problem? We fix the problem. How do we do with the turkey? Do we have turkeys now? Right, there were people that were assured that they would never hunt a single turkey or see a single turkey in their entire life. We reestablished turkeys in Texas and on the East Coast. How do we do with white-tailed deer? Right, maybe a little too good, right? We have deer out the wazoo. We have, what, 20 million deer down from, what is this, about 70,000? 70, 70,000 deer in the entire country. We fixed the problem. How did we fix the problem? 1937. That was the magic word, thank you sir. Dedicated funding. Now, nobody goes to wildlife, nobody goes to university and gets a wildlife degree to talk about funding. But what we need to realize is that, uh, if, who wants to have a job in wildlife? Okay, what do you wanna do? Ooh, um, I mean, I would like to work in an animal sanctuary. Okay, rehabilitation, rehabilitation for, for wildlife, right? What's the number one concern? Uh -huh. The number one concern is money to pay yeah. for the animal care. Yeah. They get volunteers all the time. You can imagine a lot of people like to volunteer there. They don't have money for the tests, for the vet bills, for the facilities. Number one concern. Who else wants a job in wildlife? What do you want to do? Lemur conservation. Lemur conservation. How are you going to get there? Uh, presumably like getting on a plane. Uh -huh. and, and that costs a lot of money, right? Okay, in fact, there's some jobs I've even seen for those kinds of African wildlife. Some of those jobs, you have to pay them to work there. It's, it's completely messed up and that's, that's another topic for another time. So we've solved the problem with dedicated funding. The problem is that the challenges to keep coming, right? So we figured out to save a species, to restore a species, you study it, you identify the threats, you get the money and the people, they work their butts off to solve the challenge and alleviate the threat. Then they reintroduce the species, done by research, which costs money, 
and then the species is magically restored. Y'all buy that? Y'all buy that as a, pr a potential process to recover a species? Okay, sometimes that's very generalized, but that's generally the process. The problem is those Pittman Robertson monies and later Dingle Johnson. Have y'all heard of Dingle Johnson? Okay, that word Dingle, it's going to be important in a minute. Pittman Robertson Dingle Johnson acts provided the funds which pay for biologists like you and me to do the research out in the woods with the turkeys and the deer and the quail and the pronghorn and the egrets to figure out how do we fix the problems and recover the species. But then we get a whole bunch of new challenges, right? We have to produce energy. And that energy requires huge windmills, which impacts wildlife habitat. Oops, that was not right. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh, goodness. That's, yeah. OK. And then we have to transport that energy back to the cities where the people are. We also have disease problems. We have white nose syndrome, which is devastating our bat populations. We have caves on the eastern seaboard where my colleagues would walk in and there'd be three million bats one year, and they walk in the next year and there's two. Like two bats, not two million bats, two bats. So how do we drink tequila without bats? This is a primary source of interest. Maybe just me, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, snake fungal disease. There are some herpetologists that are telling me that snake fungal disease makes white nose syndrome look like a walk in the park. That's disconcerting at least, right? What disease am I referencing here? Do you know? Chronic waste and disease. Okay, chronic waste and disease is, is, has the potential to alienate hunters. Now, why do I care about hunters? Well, where do we get all of our money? Pittman Robertson, which comes from hunters and shooting sports enthusiasts. Right, so now we have a disease that keep people from paying our bills, so we're like screwed from three different angles. Financially, ecologically, and culturally. We also have invasive species. Y'all know, know what that animal is in that trap? Those are rats. I live in San Antonio. My wife has never seen this photo, and you'll never tell her. This was from my backyard. 14 rats in one night. Rabbits. <laughs> huh? They look like rabbits. They do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's 14 rats in that trap, and then I caught another 28 in the garage. Yeah. One night? No, no, the 28 was over a couple of weeks. That's just my suburban neighborhood. That doesn't count all the ranchers that I work with that have exotic hoof stock that are out competing their native species. We have um, you know, exotic plants that are changing our ecosystems of our sensitive areas. We got a, I don't have time for this story, but we got a call about two years ago that someone had seen one of those um, pythons that they have in Florida, that they had seen it in Houston. So we, we had an all agency alert. Guess how often, how often that happens? Never. My boss was told, you have access to whatever you need. If you need 100 game wardens, if you need 30 boats and three airboats and 100 technicians, you snap your finger and you'll have it because of the damage that these invasive species can do to our ecosystems. Turned out not to be one. Oh, okay. I was going to ask if it was actually confirmed. Yeah, no, no. It was actually a, a hoax. The woman was lying. And fortunately, we didn't activate all those plans. but. It illustrates how concerned we are about some invasive species. Meanwhile, in 2019, after we've saved the deer, the elk, the pronghorn, the turkey, we have other challenges. A third of our species are at risk of extinction. 12,000 species of greatest conservation need, and if you're taking notes, write that down. Species of greatest conservation need, I'll refer to it as SGCN. 1,600 species currently listed under the Endangered Species Act, another landmark piece of legislation. 68% of our freshwater mussels are at risk, 39% of our amphibians. So this is not just a ecosystem. This is not just a population problem. This is a nationwide crisis. Now, a little, 
like a teeny bit of this is, um, is scare tactics. Why? Why would I want to scare my audiences just a little bit? Make sure they ask. Right. I want them to listen. Because otherwise, on the entertainment of the day, here's what you're talking about, butterflies and skunks and, you know, something about deer. But if I scare them a little bit, I tweak something in their emotion, and then they say, oh, this, this matters to me. So what can I do? But to y'all that are science-based, this is all science. This is not emotion. This is not hyperbole. This is what's happening. Did y'all see that report in the journal Science this summer that came out that said three billion birds have been lost since 50 years ago? Have you ever heard, who's, who has heard or read of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring? Okay, you heard of it? All right, I tried to read it and it's, it's a lot of science in it. It wasn't as, wasn't as um, kind of a lay audience as I expected, but I, I read it. Um, that was landmark because it scared people into acting. Well, we now know that we've lost three billion birds. Some species like the cerulean warbler has declined by three quarters of their entire existence. Did y'all see that painted bunting that I had? In, who has seen a painted bunting in real life? Okay, find a painted bunting. Go out, look for painted bunting. It's different than looking on a photo. Painted bunnies are gone from the eastern seaboard. Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, gone. 60% of the painted bunnies on the globe are here in Texas. So we have, as natural resource professionals, all of us, because I include you as my colleagues, all of us have a chance to reverse this. The trend keeps going, right? I have some good news, I promise. Okay, don't get too depressed. So we know that we have a whole bunch of 1,600 species of it that are on the endangered species list. That number has been in climbing. We've gotten several off. We've had some good wins to demonstrate that with funding comes species recovery. But here's, here's some more stuff, right? Who pays the bills in wildlife management right now? Hunters and shooting sports enthusiasts, people that buy firearms and ammunition, and fishing boat tackle, uh, fishing tackle and uh, fishing boat motor fuels. The problem is what's happening to our funding source. 27 million people in Texas, how many hunt? Under 4%. So it, did I just, oh, okay. So what does that mean? Now I'm no businessman, but 4% of my customers are paying the bills and 100% of us are benefiting. Is this a sustainable funding model? No. So what should we talk about? Expanding. Expanding. The range of people we're targeting. Very good. And is there a bill that in your wheelhouse that you know about? Ooh, that's fun. Why does this matter? Why does it matter? Yeah, we, wildlife impacts everybody. We have to have a functioning ecosystem to have a functioning economy. Now, y'all care about it because you're wildlife, you're in a wildlife class. Is everyone wildlife majors? Okay, all right. Um, but this matters because we need as a society to care about this. But why does it matter to you, sir? Why does it matter to you? So I'm looking for I'm going to work on a ranch, and I'm, it's going to affect me because if my wildlife and my deer populations are declining, I'm not going to have hunters coming in, and uh -huh. I'm not going to generate revenue from that. Right. Which is not going to pay the bills. Not going to pay the bills. Now, on this job, this ranch that you're working on, do you want to get paid to do yes, so? Sir. What does that take? It takes money it from ta people coming in. It takes money. Now, uh, does this ranch that you're talking about, theoretical, of course, um, need revenue in the off season? Do you know who might pay for that? I could have, we could have different events come out. Uh, like bird watchers? Or raise fundraisers, bring out students, try to generate money throughout the community somehow. So several ranches I work with, in the, in, outside of the hunting season, they bring in bird watchers. So in March and April, the bird watchers pay really good money and they don't kill anything. 
And then in September, the bird watchers come out again. They don't kill anything. And then the hunters come out and it starts the whole cycle over. So even in a hunting operation, we need to manage the entire ecosystem. Why does it matter to you, ma'am? Why, why, do why should this matter? Why might this matter? Or if you think it doesn't matter, tell me. Your lifestyle, how so? Right. Anybody considering grad school? What do you want to do? Uh, I want to do ichthyology. Ichthyology. Okay. Do you want to study um, like game fish, or do you not know? Freshwater fish in general. Guess what you can spend Dingle Johnson funds on? Fish. Game fish. So there's like hundreds and hundreds of species that have no funding. So my point is, if you want a job or a master's degree, or if you want to have functioning ecosystems for your clients, your customers, or yourself, we need to start talking about diversifying. Who said that? Um, we need to start talk, talking about diversifying our funding source. So what is a species of greatest conservation need? It's a species that is losing stability. So up here we have, give me a common species that we're not concerned about. White-tailed deer. White deer. What else? Cockroaches. <laughs> Squir fox squirrels. We're worried about pigs, but for a different reason, right? Um, raccoons, cardinals the things that are very common. And then down here we have hooping cranes, golden-cheeked warblers, right? Some mussels. But then all these species in between, goodness gracious, all those species in, in, in between were, that are declining or potentially could be declining, we call it SGCN. So it's not the species that are up here, it's the ones that are headed towards endangered species status. So some examples. Can anyone identify any of those organisms? Pintail. Northern pintail, yes sir? Kid fox or swift fox? I don't, I don't know which one it is. Horn lizard? Hooping crane, the hard one? All right, we'll call that good, prothonotary warbler. That's good. All right, so these are, these are some examples, and I show this to urban residents, city folks, and they're amazed that such beautiful animals exist. I'm going to see if this works. Texans love nature. Our rich natural heritage and diverse landscapes are parts of our tradition and enhance our lives. Texas is home to tens of thousands of native animals, plants, some found nowhere else in the world. Unfortunately, Texas is beginning to lose its beloved natural heritage. Scientists estimate that as many as one-third of our fish and wildlife species in the United States are at increased risk of extinction. The golden cheek warbler, the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, and the ocelot are among the most at risk. Imagine Texas without the horned lizard, brown pelican, or pronghorn. These species are at risk of disappearing from our state in a few short decades. States just don't have the time, money, or people to begin saving all of these struggling species. Current funding is less than 5% of what is needed to solve the problem. Unless we make a change in the way we fund conservation, the number of species on the brink of extinction will continue to grow. Luckily, there's a new bipartisan bill, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, that could provide Texas over $50 million every year and over $1.3 billion annually nationwide. This national conservation effort would be the most significant investment in wildlife conservation in over 80 years. By deploying preventative conservation measures, such as restoring habitat, providing invasive species, and controlling emerging wildlife diseases, 
we can give struggling species a fighting chance before it's too late. This investment would also connect more Texans with nature by funding outdoor recreation and education programs. And the good news is there will be no new taxes. Existing revenues would be reinvested into wildlife conservation, which is good for our wildlife, our businesses, and our citizens. This is our state. This is our nature. This is our future. Let's make sure future Texans have the same opportunities we did. Call your representatives today and ask them to support the Recovering American Wildlife Act. So dream with me. If we handed you a check, sir, if we handed you a check for fit. I handed you a check for $57 million for conservation, what would you do? A lot. <laughs> okay, give me an example. So, so I, what I'm hearing is land management, habitat restoration, and community engagement to get more people out to visit those places of wildlife. All right, uh, I, that'll probably cost $2 million. You got 55 more million to go. Anybody else? Blank check, what are you gonna do? Um, that's why I do like land restoration, grasslands and prairies. Mm, yeah. It's definitely one of the most like so with $55 million, should we tackle one county or 30? With one million? No, 50, we, he spent two, you have 55. Multiple. multiple counties? Yeah. No, I mean, I'm asking, because you can restore every ounce of prairie in one county, yeah. or restore half the county in, say, 30 counties. I'd say, like, I think half in 30 counties, just because that's a good starting point. Okay, tell me your name. Joy. Joy wants to restore prairie. What is that going to take? Anyone done any grassland restoration? We need fire trucks. We need fire. We need biologists. We need technicians to monitor the fire afterwards, see how those species are recovering. What else do we need? We need fuel for the trucks. What else? What's that? Some, we do need some, some fire-oriented biologists, right? Okay, so let's say that costs 10 million a year. We got 45 million left, and by the way, this is per year. So you have, you have like 10 months now to spend $50 million. What are you gonna do? I thought we should use wetlands. Ooh, restore wetlands. Should we restore one wetland or the entire coast of Texas? I mean, I would like to say the entire coast. Let's do it. Don't worry about Louisiana, you know why? They get their own pot of money, they do. right? So now we're talking some entire, what if, ooh, what if, we, what if we drop like $15 million a year for five years to restore the oyster, the oyster reefs off the shore of Texas? Restore that entire ecosystem, which regenerates, which is basically served as a nursery for the entire Gulf of Mexico. How many species can we recover with just that one purchase? Hundreds, hundreds of fish, hundreds of mussels. What if we took some of that money and stopped the pollution in the rivers that's impacting the bays and estuaries? Or ensure freshwater flow so that your wetlands have water, right? Now do you see the, the scope of the kinds of things that we could do with this money? And by the way, like I said, in a year we're gonna get 57 more million dollars and you gotta spin it all over again. Like, I'm gonna have to hire someone just to spend money. Like, that's gonna be his only job. Who wants that job? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so, with this, who allocates 
where the money goes. Mm. So um, we'll get into that. And if I don't, interrupt me and tell me. It, it's basically uh, the conservation community goes to the state wildlife agency and works out a spending plan. OK, more at-risk wildlife. Who can identify these? Just yell out one of them. Black skimmer. Black skimmer, yes, sir. Texas tortoise. Texas tortoise. Pronghorn. Pronghorn. Oh, very good. That's good. OK. So the nuts and bolts that you already know, because you've studied this, is the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, HR 3742, allocates 1.3 billion from existing taxes into the Wildlife Conservation Restoration Program, and it can only be used to fund species of greatest conservation need. We can't use this for white-tailed deer. We can't use this for cardinals and raccoons. Of course I did. So, we can't use this for the common species. We have, to, we have to target those species of concern. And then our share is 57 million based on our population and our land area. Right now, we have 148 co-sponsors. In the House of Representatives, 435 members. If it comes up for a vote, we need half. So we need 218 yes votes. So out of 218 yes votes needed, we have 148 promises of a yes vote. So we're like almost there. Like this is, this could happen. Y'all could be a part of something historic. Bipartisan support, roughly 75-25 in terms of our co-sponsors, which is about what it is in the House. So this is not a divisive issue. Our companies that we talk to and our Republicans that we talk to say, this is investing in preventive maintenance. This is changing the oil in your truck before it runs out of oil. We want to keep the species from becoming endangered for whatever reason, political or biological or business-wise, whatever it is, we all want the same thing. Now, one major step that we have to have is we have to have a hearing. You can't get a bill passed without a hearing. We got the hearing. That happened a couple weeks ago. Where are we on our timeline? Have you all read about the Blue Ribbon Panel? No? Some of you have. Who, who has and who has not? It's not a trap, I promise. Who has? OK, so about half. The Blue Ribbon Panel was a group of business people and non-government organizations like Audubon and uh, NRA and the Boone and Crockett Club and um, uh, Ducks Unlimited and Quail Forever and Turkey's uh, National Wild Turkey Federation. All these people got together with oil and gas executives, Republicans, Democrats, to say, what is the solution? And what they said is, um, we think that their, Congress should pass a bill for, that funds $1.3 billion. So everything that we're talking about today is a result of this Blue Ribbon Panel's recommendation. They did that work in 2014. And at the end of next year, Congress adjourns. So where are we in this process? What do you think? Half, who's, Shout out a number. Halfway? 60%? 20%? 25%. OK, we're about 25% of the way there. So what that means is y'all can get in on the ground floor and be a part of history. Who is this going to benefit? Well, basically, it's going to benefit everyone. The way we're going to spend the money, it's going to benefit anyone that likes to breathe clean air and drink clean water. That's number one. It's going to benefit all these organizations, whether they're university, research institutions, hunters and anglers, private landowners, birders, paddlers, hikers, campers, game and non-game interests, ecotourists, energy industry. I talk to cities all the time, and they say, Richard, how can we get more people visiting our cities to look at birds? Because it means money in our restaurants and our hotels. All right. How serious are you? And they say, we're serious. I say, all right, then you need to start building infrastructure for bird watching. And they say, yes, sir, and they do it. And it, it, the payoff is unbelievable. How will we spend the money? The way you all have already said it. 85% of it will be stewardship, best management practices, research, habitat restoration, voluntary land protection. The other 15% will be education and recreation, because if we don't invest in our future generations, we're going to be in this mess in 80 years, the same mess. So long term, we're going to invest in the future so that they understand that we need to keep investing in this. Yes, sir? Uh, when I was like, looking at opposition to this, the only one I could find from like, a lot of organization was 
they thought they think it's like what t minimum of ten percent can be mm -hmm. on endangered species, yeah. and they were like that's way too low. Right. So like I understand like they only make up about ten percent of the SGNC, but like that's like pretty low. So Y'all want to know some behind the scenes info on that? That's a lot of crap. That Defenders of Wildlife letter, and I'm a little biased because I'm advocating for the, the act, right? Defenders of Wildlife was invited to the table because they opposed the last bill, and they, so Representative Dingell said, what do you want? And they said, we want money dedicated for endangered species so that these states don't spend it just on that top half of that curve. So Debbie Dingell changed the bill to require states to spend at least 10% of the money on endangered species because Defenders of Wildlife asked, them, asked her to, and then they came out and opposed the bill. Why would Defenders of Wildlife oppose the bill? Why would they object to something they asked for? It may How does Defenders of Wildlife make their money? They make their money from donations from court, for court battles. So they make their money by opposing things. And they pay the bills by, especially in today's political climate, if they're, up, if they're against something, help us stop this. Help us fight this. And the donations come rolling in. And if, if they, if Defenders of Wildlife came to you and said, can you give us a donation to help us support this bill versus fight this bill, emotionally, which one are we inclined to do? Fight. So it's all about the money. That's my personal opinion. Yes? Well, isn't it up to the states to list species of greatest conservation needs? Yes. So if states wanted to, they could start listing white-tailed deer and all these other species that aren't necessarily like, close to being endangered. Or right. So could that also be a concern that they might have? Um, they m possibly, um, but Fish and Wildlife Service is the governor on this they get to decide if something is truly a species of concern. So in other words, if, if Texas, if you, what's your name? Deirdre. Deirdre, if you came to me, Parks and Wildlife and said, I want, this, I want this species to be an SGCN. And we say, OK, fine. We'll list it as an SGCN. We have, still have to put a proposal together and get it approved by Fish and Wildlife Service. And if they say, guys, cardinals are not a concern, we're not going to fund this, then it's not funded. So we already have those controls built into the process. So we have state and national alliances built to help support this effort. The strategy for the next two years is to widen the circle. This is why I'm here today, because I need your help to participate in this process to put your name on this bill, to put your fingerprint on this bill so that when you graduate and you become a paid professional, you're already a professional, when you become a paid professional, I want you to look back and say, hey, I was a part of that. I learned about that. I was active in that before it even became a bill, before it even became law. So the goal is to widen the circle. Now, to widen the circle, to talk about this with your peers, with your professors, with your partners, with your businesses, you have to know about it, right? So you've you already done a lot of the research about how the bill is structured and where it came from, but I want you to know physically how will we spend the money. And by we, I don't mean Parks and Wildlife, because Parks and Wildlife can't spend this money by ourselves. They will never let me hire 10 herpetologists. They might let me hire one more herpetologist and they will give money to universities and nonprofits to do all the research. So I want you to know how will we spend the money. So take a look at this report here. And this is a task force report that we put together to give examples. It doesn't list exactly who gets the money and how much. It just gives you examples. The kinds of big thinking, like maybe we need urban wildlife biologists. Right now, I have a team of nine urban wildlife biologists. Who remembers how many Texans there are? So let me just write that down. 27 million customers. And how many biologists do we have? 
nine urban biologists. Do you think maybe we need to hire more people to help these 27 million to make it relevant to them? So I want you to know those kinds of examples. So take a look at this report. It answers how will the money be spent for all partners. This is for the entire conservation community. Anyone y'all could work for or with is eligible to get this money. We want to widen the circle of the people working on this. Why is it doing that? OK, so the goal is to talk to people. Now, if you're like me, I don't really like people. Like, I didn't get in this field to talk to people. I got in this field to walk in the woods and study bobcats. That's, that was what I wanted to do. But what about what is a step in this policy process? Does it work if we as scientists do our research and put the research on a shelf and then go on to the next research project? No, we as scientists have a responsibility, an opportunity even, to take our knowledge and excite other people about that knowledge. Hey, how, how often have you called someone and say, you'll never believe what I learned today? Have you ever done that? Who's done that? Okay, so we can do that and we can excite other people to be interested in in our stuff. How many of you have friends that when they see something nature you related, they call you and say, look what I saw, did you know this, or look what I found today? Because people crave nature. They crave your knowledge and they crave your leadership on what is important to pay attention to. Every single election day, president, governor, whatever, I get people that call me and say, how should I vote on proposition whatever? I'm not your mama, I'm not your dad, I'm not your counselor. Why do they call me? And they trust me because I'm a scientist. And they trust you because you're a scientist. So we have to talk to people about recovering America's Wildlife Act. So the question is, well, Richard, I'm, I'm an undergrad at A&M. What in the world could I possibly do? Well, I'll, let me throw it back at you. I'm a 43-year-old A&M graduate. I live in San Antonio with my wife and my daughter. I'm a medium-level supervisor at Parks and Wildlife. What can I do? I don't work in DC. I don't hobnob with donors and friends of governors. What can I do? And all of you are saying, come on, you're a wildlife biologist. Of course you have to do something, right? So I would suggest that we all have an opportunity to get involved. Who are your partners? Are they student chapter of the Wildlife Society? Are they student chapters of conservation biology? Do you all have a student chapter of the American Fisheries Society here? Yep. What other organizations do you have? Society for Range Management? What else? What am I missing? Society. Yeah, that's a good one. Anyone else? Ducks and do you have a student chapter of Ducks Unlimited? Okay. Texas Trophy Hunters. Te yeah. Lots of people care about wildlife, don't they? So maybe even academic partners. Who in this class maybe kind of sorta of has a professor? Do you think Dr. Barboza has a network? Do you think he has a like a really good network? National network even maybe? So has any have any of you approached Dr. Barboza and said, hey, who can you call to support Recovering America's Wildlife Effect? Who's done that? I have done that. That's bad. I should probably do that. So maybe if you have professors and they have networks, you can lean on them to get involved. Of course, landowners and donors, and I give this talk to a lot of people, so a lot of organizations have donor lists and boards and committee chairs and all this stuff. They work with other NGOs. Um, they work with businesses, they work with trade organizations. So the, qu the question is not, who do you know that is best friends with Governor Abbott? Or do you happen to know uh, Representative McCall? Who's the college station rep? Do you happen to know? I, I don't remember. So I, you don't have to know the congressman that represents Brad Brazos County. But I bet you know someone that is willing to help. So the, when you go to them, when I go to them and say, look, there's this bill 
that we're all very excited about that's game-changing, transformational funding can recover 12,000 species of concern nationwide, 1,300 species of concern only in Texas. We can solve that problem in just a few years with time, people, and money. And you know what they're going to ask me? It's right there. How are you going to spend the money? So you all know that. We've already done that exercise. Read that report, gives you some more examples. 85% of it will be on stewardship and on the ground conservation, and the other 15% will be education and outdoor uh, recreation. Pitch the vision. Whatever they care about. Are you talking to the Texas Raptor Rehabilitation Society? Talk about peregrine falcons. Talk about osprey. Talk about those kinds of birds. Who mentioned Ducks Unlimited? Right? There's a lot of waterfowl that are not doing very well right now because they don't qualify for some of the existing money. Most importantly, you're not alone. You can partner with us, you can partner with professors, you can partner with, you can lean on the uh, advisors and the officers of these chapters. You gotta sell your vision, and to sell your vision, you have to know your vision. So think about how would you, what is that one issue that you care about? Are you concerned about painted buntings or eastern meadowlarks or the spot-tailed earless lizard or the wetland degradation or the oyster reefs or the fish in the Gulf of Mexico, raptors, private lands incentives? Maybe landowners need some help fixing their fences to help the pronghorn. Where can you act? Well, you can act at any of those levels. Now, what I encourage you not to say is, I'm just a student. Because you're not just a student, you're a scientist, and you have knowledge and passion and excitement, and you can make a difference. You can work through your organization. You can work by recruiting people that will speak for you. You can, maybe, if you're so-called, now this makes me want to throw up, this talking directly to Congress. Like, I, I went to DC. And I talked to people, I talked to, uh, there were some years I talked to 5,000 people. And I sat outside that congressman's office and I almost vomited. I was so nervous, right? So that's not something I want to do. But maybe you are predisposed to do that. Or maybe you know someone that can do that and you can encourage them to do it. Some people love doing that and they just need a direction or an idea or a cause. Maybe you want to work behind the scenes supporting Parks and Wildlife and National Wildlife Federation. So the most important thing is to take action. But are we getting nervous here? Is Richard telling you to become political? Is anyone nervous? Is anyone uncomfortable about this talk? We're not talking about bobcats in the woods anymore. So what have I been doing this morning? I've been talking about what the science says I've been talking about what the science has said and what the science says the challenges are and what the science says are the solutions and telling you the impact of, the, of that solution. Have I at any time said, please call your congressman? That's advocacy. Everything else we've been talking about is science and science communication and sharing information and motivating and exciting. I want you guys to think about how can you motivate others to take action on behalf of science. So here's some ideas. Some other universities have said, Richard, we want to challenge other student chapters of the Wildlife Society or AFS or ConBio. We want to challenge other student chapters to, to do something. So can a and student chapter of whatever organization write more letters than Humboldt State? UC Davis, Texas A&M Kingsville, Tarleton, Sol Ross. We hate those guys. Not really. Can we have this little fun competition about which university can do more stuff, write more letters, make, make more phone calls, or get more professors to sign on to the TWS, the Wildlife Society Scientist Support Letter? Even if you just do that, what's happening at the national level is they go into these congressmen's office congressmen and congresswomen, and they say, nationwide, we have a 1,000 scientists 
that say this is important. And you know what those congressmen and congresswomen say? How many of them are in my district? So what if we got seven student chapters in Texas to recruit a couple of dozen professionals and scientists to sign this letter, and we, we bump that number up to 2,000 scientists or 3,000 scientists? So just so you know, just for a frame of reference, a couple weeks ago we were at 600. I made one phone call to a pro professor at Tarleton. That professor got her student chapter involved, student chapter of the Wife Society, and one week later we were at 900. So what can the A&M student chapter do to get more scientists to sign on to this support letter? You can work with partners. Maybe you're a member of the, what'd you say, the Zoological Association? Zoological Society. Zoological Society. And maybe that organization can challenge the American Fisheries Society. A little shame, a little guilt, a little emotion. No, no, science. It's science. That's what this is about. What if you all have talents that I haven't thought about? Could you use your social media presence to get some support or increase people's understanding or knowledge about this, right? So the focus uh, from a state and national perspective is on members of Congress. But we haven't even talked about grassroots general population level. So what if we could use our uh, video talents and social media talents to get more of our friends, family, and networks to call their congressperson? to support Recovering America's Wildlife Act. The timeline is that we are accepting co-sponsors, and co-sponsor is that commitment, kind of a pseudo-commitment to vote for the bill. This is gonna happen through the end of December. After that, it's gonna make it out of committee and they can't accept co-sponsors anymore. What happens is the bill is introduced. Do y'all know this? No, bill is introduced, it gets assigned to a committee, that committee makes changes and sends it to the floor of the House to vote. Once it's sent to the floor of the House, that bill might have changed from its original introduction, and so they can't, they can't accept co-sponsors. So Representative Dingell, y'all remember that name? It is the daughter-in-law of the original Dingell from Dingell Johnson. So Dingell in the 50s had a son, became congressman, and then his, when he died, his wife ran for his seat, and Debbie Dingell introduced this bill to carry on the legacy of her family. One question I have is, like, I know you mentioned how, like, they were, um, that they would, like, fund a lot of research for, like, game animals. Do they do non-game animals, too? So Recovering America's Wildlife Act doesn't differentiate between game and non-game. Okay. It's for any species of concern. Okay. Now, when you talk to the biologists that work for these state agencies, most of their SGCNs are non-game. Okay. But we don't, we don't make that distinction much because this is not an us versus them. Like, I could very easily say, well, game species have had money since 1937. It's time to spend money on non-game. That's, that's bogus because it's all ecosystem-based, right? Does that answer your question? OK. So, we're gonna accept organizational letters of support. Maybe your society, maybe your business, maybe your parents, maybe your neighbors want to put their organization behind this. That, that could happen anytime. And then grassroots calls and emails through the end of 2020. And the goal is to get this passed at the end of 2020. But really, the challenge is we have to talk to people. That's the only way this is gonna work. We cannot go into the woods and study bobcats like I wanted to do because your research will do good work on the shelf or with the 10 people that read it, right? Or maybe it's the right 10 people and now you're impacting an entire county or an entire landscape, but we have an opportunity here to change how the entire nation funds its wildlife management and guarantees y'all's jobs. Because if this gets passed, I'm going to be hungry for people. I will not be able to fill the positions fast enough. I need 10 herpetologists, I need five ornithologists. There's some people are talking about, we have a, about, um, we have about 150 county level biologists. That's not right. We have about 100 county level biologists. We, we, some people are talking, if this thing passed, getting one or two biologists per county. So doubling or tripling the workforce. 
more research, more consultants, more species being saved. So what questions do you have? That one? Yes. Okay. What year is that? Because this is one of the sources that I have cited. Okay. I don't know what year it's from. So it was originally written in 2017. About three weeks ago, we revised it and updated it in 2019. Didn't change it much, just changed a couple numbers because the new bill made some tweaks and we had to reflect that, that tweak. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and then um, also, how you mentioned a little bit earlier about the how the SGCN gets decided, mm -hmm. but what kind of proposal has to be written and what kind of review does it have to go to? Like what makes it an SGCN that is documentable? So the question is, what makes a species an SGCN? That, that can be like verified. OK. So you're not talking about how to fund it through this. You're talking about just the, the categorization of SGCN. So the way that works is a state agency will work with the entire conservation community of its state to write the action plan. The action plan is a document required to get a different pot of money that we've had to have since 2000. In that plan, we were required to go seek community um, input on which species should be SGCN. One strategy said only the most important species, only the most um, derelict, declining, uh, high priority species should be SGCN. And other people said, well, wait, wait, what about those species that are at the top of that curve that don't need $10 million, they need $10,000. With just a little bit of money, we can 